How are y'all? Alright, who enjoyed Epic Foosball? Like, honestly. No! That's it. Epic Foosball? Human Foosball. Alright, I got some honest hands in the room. I like it. I dig it. That was a uh, shout out to all my wildlife people. Listen, sometimes the best inspiration is middle schoolers. They are some of the greatest people on the planet. Hands down. Amen. And if you're not a middle schooler, I still love you, but you should be reaching out, leaning into, and plugging the middle schoolers in your life. Hey, before we get started, so as you may have noticed, I got two, two quick things I want to talk about real quick. First, May 24th, that is because there is graduation. You can thank one of your small group leaders who is way better at what she does than what I do, and she paid attention, and she was like, that's right! Um, and she was like, hey, you know that like North Gwinnett and Ridge like, have their graduations that Wednesday? And I'm like, no, no idea. So here's what's going to happen is that was supposed to be the last night of the series. We're going to talk self-control. If there's anything that like all of us are probably wanting to hear more about, it's self-control. Like, had a student Sunday morning go like, hey man, off the top of your head, do you have scriptures on self-control? And I'm like, who do you think I am? Jesus? Like, no. Now, I can Google something pretty quick and do some research. But for real, like, it's a thing that I think we all want to learn more about. It's like, how do I make wise decisions and execute self-control in my friendships, my family, my school, my neighbors, etc.? So here's what's going to happen. Um, May 22nd, it's a Monday afternoon. I know some of y'all are going to still be in school. I think high schoolers, you should have half days that last week. That's typically how that goes down, is you get half days the last three days of school. Just Tuesday, Wednesday? Be small group B. Okay, so here's basically what's going to happen is we're going to record that talk. And we're going to record it on Monday the 22nd. If you're out of school and able to make it, I'm thinking like 3 p.m., 3.15, be here. It helps me, okay, teach without just going off the train. And then you get like an hour and a half message that you did not need. Okay, so if you're available, I know a few of you are. I don't need a whole bunch of you, but if you're able to make it at like 3 o'clock, 3.15, we'd love to have you. We're going to record that, and then on Wednesday the 24th, we'll publish the, the talk on self-control to our YouTube because we do value the scripture and what we've been teaching through that high. Like, it's going to be posted, and so if you care about it, that's where it will be Wednesday night sometime. You can catch it in between graduations or even at your own graduation while you're waiting for community college. You can be like down here and like, Oh, yeah, preach it. Yeah, you know, amen. Oh, my name, huh? You know, congratulations, you graduated. All right, don't be like that one kid at my graduation who did the church dance across stage. It was a weird time. All right. Um, second thing, camp. Y'all. Yeah. Yes. She's excited. Listen, if we can get 15 people, which means you're about halfway there, sign up for camp, we will bring clippers, and that morning before we depart for camp, I will let you humiliate me and buzz my head. As, as, as little hair as you want to leave left as possible. You gotta go to camp. I mean, you can mohawk it, which means that my first summer camp, my first summer camp with y'all, I might have the most embarrassing photos of my existence. And I've got some super hush, I'm talking. Well, what, what, what you got? First mohawk. I've never had a mohawk. So that means, that means you've got like four weeks left to get you and your people signed up. Invite your friends. And listen, if you're like, hey, money is an issue, please come talk to me. We have people in our church who are so generous that they are willing to help either with a partial scholarship or a full scholarship. If you know you've got margin and availability to be at camp, which could radically transform your life and your friendships. And money is the only obstacle. Don't let it be. You come talk to me. We'll make sure, even if I have to get into a fight with my wife and I pay for you to go to camp, we'll make sure you get to camp. That's how serious I am about the power of summer camp. And some of y'all are like, I want to go, but all my friends are gone. Guess what? Your friends are saying the same thing. So both of you make a plan, go home tonight, and be like, hey, let's sign up together. All right? So 15 people, you get to buzz my head or shape it or whatever. Bleach it. You gotta bring your own bleach. I ain't bring. Okay. All right. I just, I just got myself in some serious trouble here. Um, and then if money's an issue, you let me know, and we will, we will talk through it. But you gotta be going to camp. All right. All right. So tonight, cause I gotta get rolling. We are in part four of the series called Bear Fruit, and basically we've just taken Galatians five twenty two through twenty three, 
and we've been talking about what it looks like when we follow Jesus and then the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and then because he's way better than we are, he produces a fruit. And it's a singular fruit described by nine characteristics. And Jesus fully embodied all nine of these and then as we follow Jesus, we begin to represent and look more and more like these. And so the last couple of weeks, we've been working through each of these characteristics. But we talked about love. What does it mean to love one another? In the way that Christ loved us. We talk about joy and peace and how we can have joy that surpasses understanding and the way it looks from God's perspective and, and having peace with other people as well as having peace with God. Um, last week we talked about patience. Talk about kind of slowing down and, and thinking through decisions and making wise decisions based on that and how when we rush into things the world's way and what the world is teasing us with, we tend to produce a fake version of ourselves. And I challenge you that this place is not a place for fake people. That we're hurting, broken, real, authentic, and I want you to bring your authentic selves and your authentic friends, just like I'm authentic with you. No fakeness, because Jesus didn't die for the fake you. He died for the real you. And so tonight, we're gonna jump into the next two characteristics of scriptures of the fruit of the spirit, of kind of who Jesus is and embodies. And so if you need a memory verse for this month, and by now, I might memorize for some of you. Uh, here it is. Galatians 5, 22 23 says this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. So tonight, we're going to talk about kindness and goodness. Kindness and goodness. And much like last week with patience, there's not like one passage that like, Paul or Peter sits down or even James and is like, here is the doctrine of kindness and goodness. It's a theme. It's all throughout scripture. It's a characteristic of God that we see played out over and over again from the Old Testament in Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And so what I want to do is, is just give some basic definitions because y'all have had so much fun learning Greek words and it just got harder and harder. Y'all notice that. They've been kind of goofy and really difficult. So tonight you're going to learn three, but for the first two, and you don't, you don't need to memorize this, it's just for fun, okay? All right, this first Greek word for kindness is uh, Christotesis. Christotesis. Yeah, I don't know I'm sure I'm saying that right. It also sounds like a weightless palate, okay? Uh, but straight translated, this means moral goodness, integrity, benignity, and kindness. Now the definition of kindness, thank you Google, is the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. Goodness is the Greek word agathusene. Agathusene. Say that five times fast. Your teacher will think you're cussing. Translated, uprightness of heart and life, goodness, and kindness. The definition is the quality of being morally good or virtuous. I hope something stood out. And it's there's a t bunch of similarities between these two. There's like a bunch of parallels. I noticed words overlapping. Goodness was used. One of those words meant kindness and goodness in the same definition. So they're overlapping with each other. So Paul's basically repeating himself. And when we see repetition, that's when you really need to pay attention because it means it's an important thing to look at and to examine. And I think overall that most of us here tonight would like to believe that we are kind. Or that we are good. That when we look at our lives, we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm nice to people. I'm sweet, I'm caring. I help the lady across the street get my premier badge and occasionally open a door for a lady. And I say please and thank you. I put the silverware on the right side. But side. Somebody help me, like, I don't know either. Right? But you, you, think you're, you think you're fine. Maybe you think you're overall good. You're like, yeah, I, occasionally I cuss a little, drive a little too fast. You know, I hit my brother once when I was like three. But overall, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So I want us to challenge ourselves with a couple of questions. And, and don't raise your hands at these questions. I appreciate your honesty, but for now, I just want you to sit in this moment. And if you're taking notes, feel free to write, feel free to write these questions down as they might be something useful for you in your quiet times to reflect on as you spend time with the Lord. And the first question is this. Does my life reflect and show kindness to others? Does my life reflect and show kindness to others? Remember the definition said friendly, generous, and considerate. Are these things that people opposite of you, 
sitting next to you, waiting for you at home when you get there, classmates in your school, are these things that they would say about you? Like, as they look in on your life, could they be like, yeah, he's friendly. She's generous. I guess they're considered. Would your family and friends say these things about you? Second question is this. Does that kindness or goodness lead or point others to Christ? Is what you show others helping others see Jesus? And may I challenge you that helping others see Jesus in a loving way is true kindness. And I get it, it can feel uncomfortable or awkward to share with your friends about Jesus. It's real, okay? It feels awkward for adults too. And part of that reasoning is because it's uncomfortable to them. It's because the gospel is uncomfortable to those who are dying. I know that sounds super morbid, but if what we believe is true is that we all have a sin problem, and, and then the, the end result of our sin is that we die and are eternally separated from God, and then here we come and say, hey, there's a way to be restored, but it means you give up control of your own life, which then the enemy is lying to you and saying, why would you do that? You have it so good. Your sin is so pleasurable. It's so fun. How many people have gotten to the end of their path of sin and are honestly where they want to be? How many people have watched so many things online that they can bite into and say, yeah, I'm happy, and not actually fighting major depression, anxiety, and science proves it. Y'all, sin is fun for a season. And Jesus says, I've come to have give you life and life to the full. Life is actually enjoyable God's way inside his plan. And the enemy is screaming at you that it's not. And so when we get told, like, hey, there's a way to have a better life, it's uncomfortable because we have to surrender control. And it's, it can be awkward at times. The true kindness is helping your friends move from death and their sin to life and life. That's true kindness. And I'm not saying you do it in a way where you're like bashing your friends with the Bible over the head and like you need to have not behavior modification. But what's it like to love them where they're at and help them see that like following Jesus is worth it? Might be difficult, but hard things in life are usually worth it. All right, number three, third question to reflect on. Does that kindness reflect Christ's kindness in and for me? Do you recognize Christ's kindness towards you, his love for you, and do you accept it? Because loved people love people. And if you've never heard anybody give you permission tonight, y'all be kind to yourself. I swear the American generation of you, this generation, is the hardest, most brutal, most vicious critics of themselves because you've got the little device in your pocket where you're posting things about yourself every day though it doesn't hit a certain amount of likes or maybe it's your sports team that you're on and perform a certain way it's not your coach who's the first person beating you up you're beating yourself up on the way back to your coach and then you take a second ditch no be kind to yourself you're teenagers you're gonna drop a ball you're gonna get an f on a math test it's okay, there's grace for the F's of math, okay? Your AP exams are not going to come back with results even though you study and study and study and study and study. Listen, sometimes an AP environment is not your thing. It's okay. Be kind to yourself. Because the greater of kindness you have for yourself, the greater it flows out into the way you are showing kindness to other people. And ultimately that comes from a beautiful understanding of Christ's kindness toward you. So you're sitting here and like, that sounds great. There's some colloquialisms in there. It's like a fancy word. And some, some fun phrasings and sayings. They're like, show me. Where, where is God's, can you, can, you, can you show me God's kindness? Like, where is it in scripture? Or, or how do I find it? What does it look like? What does kindness and goodness look like? And the answer is going to sound really bad. It's going to sound almost upside down. Because that's how we serve it. He defies our life. Y'all, God's kindness, the greatest display of his kindness and his love and his goodness towards you is on that cross. It's on the cross. Your mamas love you. Your friends love you. But they're also going to let you go through some tough things. And God will as well. But God loves you so much. His creation. That when, you're, when the created us blew it, he 
didn't just reboot the system. Y'all three make jokes about that before, where if I were God, right, we'd have Earth version 32 and be the multiverse out here, because it's like, well, that one failed us. Reboot Apple M2 chip or something. Y'all, God looks down at his creation, and then if you go through the, the Old Testament, like, he calls a people unto himself, and it's this beautiful thing where he's like, I love you so much, I'm calling you, you're my chosen people, and then they start, they start disobeying, they're not paying attention, he's like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I want to make a plan. And I'm going to restore you. And then as I restore you, my chosen people, I'm going to restore all of humanity at the same time. Most of us, when we fail something, we start there. I'm not saying God failed. He knew what he was doing. But we as his creations dropped the ball. Yeah, he loved us so much that the creator created a way for restoration. And that was kindness. That was his goodness on display, was through Jesus on the cross, that pinnacle moment for you and for me. Despite all the junk that we've done, regardless of what our behaviors look like, or whatever it is that we're trapped in. And he did that so we would abandon our selfish and sinful desires, and then we could be restored to a life-giving relationship in Jesus. Romans 2 4 says this. It's one of the most, I've been meditating on this verse for a while now after I first heard it. It says, Paul is writing, and for context, we're early on in the entire book of Romans. This is one verse, so we have to be careful not to take it completely out of context. Basically, he is setting up his argument for the gospel. And in chapter one, he's kind of talking about the depravity of man, how without God and his restoration power, we are left to our own devices and we. We run after destruction, and we pretty much end up killing ourselves in our sin, and it's really brutal and grotesque, and Paul doesn't hold back much of this. And then in chapters 2 and 3, and, and kind of building towards chapter 6 and 7, where he'll get to this kind of ultimate swing of like, hey, we have Jesus. He, he is talking about how our sin actually creates a level playing field between like the Jews and the Gentiles. That's us. We're Gentiles, okay? We are not Jewish, unless you are. Welcome. We're glad you're here. All right? But everybody else, okay? And... As he's going in this part of chapter 2, he's talking about the law and how certain people were trying to save themselves by having this perfect checklist and doing all of these things and doing them perfectly. And that's where Paul says, he's like, do you despise the riches of his kindness? Are you ignoring God's kindness because you think you can do all these things perfectly? Or God's restraint, that's part of his patience, like I talked about last week, where he's kind of, he's like, no, I believe in him. I said, my son, I believe, I'm waiting. It's patience. Now recognize that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It's intended to lead you to repentance. And that line is huge. And unfortunately, in churches across America, unfortunately, in, in Christianity and in media, repent gets a bad rap. Because many of you probably have driven by, like, the Mall of Georgia, or you went to a, a concert, and you saw the guy standing out there with the bullhorns, in the signs, and it says, like, repent or burn, right? Repent or X whatever. I mean, you, you fill in the blank. You've seen them. First of all, I, don't, I question those guys, because if that's the way you're trying to get pulled into heaven, I don't think you've actually met the love of Jesus. That's a whole lot of do better, do better behavior modification. That's not what God's about. You see, repent in, in the Greek is this word metanoia. It's metanoia. And, and what metanoia literally means is change of mind. It's change of mind. It's not a big list. It's not a whole bunch of do-betters. It's not a whole bunch of here's how you need to look perfectly on paper. It's just change of mind. And so the question is then like, okay, what do we need to change our minds about? Because if we're reading this, it means that God's kindness is intended to lead you to a change of mind. So what are we changing our minds about? Well, A.W. Tozer, who's an older theologian, he writes that the, the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. The most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. C.S. Lewis then argues back to him and says, no, the most important thing is what God thinks of you. And here's the beautiful thing, is that they're both partly right. Because when we fully understand what God thinks about us, 
It will then change what we think about God. Because there are some of you in this room where your version of God is this high, far-off person who's got a giant to-do list. And if you don't keep up with the giant to-do list, the foot comes stomping down. You grew up like I did, super legalistic and full of religion, and it stings. It's not fun. You don't want to hang around in it. You're waiting until your senior year, and then you're bouncing. See it, church. I don't need you. Some of y'all, God is this wrathful, vengeful, just hates everybody. For others of you, God is just the big man upstairs. You pop in on occasionally and make sure, like, hey, God, you know, like, I got a math test coming up. Can you, like, handle it or something or whatever you do? There's no relationship. And so I think there's a lot of us who we have an improper understanding of the God of the universe. And like I said earlier with, with God's kindness, y'all, he wants a relationship. He is a God who loved his creation so much that even when they broke the code, he made a way. He loves you. He's chasing after you. There's some of you in the room he's been chasing after every time you're here and you feel that tug. You just haven't stepped forward yet. And he says, I just want a relationship. Listen, it's change of mind, not change of behavior. As you change your mind, behavior comes. Like when you finally get in that one car wreck because you were texting and driving, hopefully none of y'all ever had that situation. But let's say it happens. Let's say it happens. You know what's going to happen? Is your mind will change about texting and driving. After that wreck, after that bill, after that talk to you about your parents, your mind will change. You know what's going to change because of your mind changing on texting and driving? That phone's going down. You won't text and drive anymore. God's not saying, hey, get it all right and then come to me, metanoia. No, I want you to understand how much I love you and then have your mind change about what you think of me. It's a change of mind. That's what repentance is. Not some kind of to-do list, not some kind of get it perfect, not kind of live perfectly. It's simply just when you understand what God thinks of you, your mind just might change about what you think of him. And so his kindness leads us to these new thoughts of him. And for many of you, his kindness is on display even now. Regardless of what you believe, the fact that you're sitting here, that you've got shoes on, you've got parents who are bringing you or guardians who are bringing you, you go to a decent school, you live in a good county, that's God's kindness. It's on display. It's here. The fact that you're sitting and listening to scripture being preached Hearing the word, because it's, it's through hearing of the word that comes knowledge and then leads to salvation. That's a kindness. The fact that God even gave us this is a kindness. That he would lay out his heart in a written text. Some of you are like, hey, I never heard the voice of God. Sometimes the voice of God sounds a lot like me just cracking this open and reading. Oh, that's your heart. Oh, that's what you want me to do. And yes, he's going to discipline like a good dad, like a good parent. But it's because he loves you. He loved you first enough to the discipline you and say, hey, I've got so much better for you. And so his kindness is parted with his goodness. And David lifts this praise of promise that he believes about God in Psalm 23, 6. And he says this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord Forever, So he ties goodness with mercy, and mercy is this compassion or forgiveness shown someone whom it is well within reason for there to be severe consequences. It's, it's like when you break a law and go before a king or a governor, and then instead of dealing out that traffic ticket or that prison sentence, they're like, I'm going to show you mercy, I'm going to give you a second chance. David says it follows him all the days of his life. And that was pre-Jesus. He didn't have the great high priest yet. We do. So it follows the days of our lives as well. Y'all, it means every morning God's mercies are extended toward us. Regardless of the things that we do and the junk that we mess up on, he's extending it to us every day. There's not some kind of quota or contract on God's kindness and goodness. They are as eternal as he is. And he is calling us to act with kindness and goodness toward others. So how does this look for us, for an imperfect, broken people yet loved by a good and gracious Heavenly Father to act with kindness and goodness. Well, it goes back again to proper love, that sacrificial love, that agape love that we talked about in week one. 
Here's what Paul says in Philippians 2. I promise we're wrapping up quick. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should not look to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Kindness requires you to be humble. Kindness requires humility. In your friendships, in your relationships, in your, with your parents, it's you saying, not what can I get out of it for me, but what can I do for them? In my marriage, it's best on display when I get home from work. And I could, I could throw a pout, I could throw a sting, I could be like, oh, I need to put my feet up, I need to chill out, let me get in the kitchen, let me some grilled cheese or something. Totally inappropriate. Or it's, okay, my wife works really hard to help feed us because we're in that generation where both parents work. We got an almost two-year-old at home, and she's awesome, but she's also so much energy. She talks nonstop, y'all. I've heard she already knows like 200 words or something like that. It's crazy. Okay. And she's running, and she's jumping, and she wants to swing, and she has mama nuts. And so mama's at home working, and she's got this two-year-old. So when I get home, a way I can show kindness, a way I can say not what is in it for me, but what can I do for her, is just change a diaper, clean up some dishes, do some laundry. So what are the things in your friendships and your relationships with your parents at home that you can put somebody else first? And in a perfect world, it's a service competition. You're both putting each other first. And what I found by doing things in this way is that our relationship is healthier, there's more peace in our home, there's fewer roots of bitterness trying to take hold, and it's a perfect world where the relationship, both parties are out serving the other. So we're gonna wrap, we're the banner, gonna come back up here. Um, and as, as they come, come back up, here's what we're going to do. I got, I got a list of 10 things, some semi-practical, it's not all-encompassing, you know it's more specific to you. But here's a list of 10 things, 10 ways that you can show the kindness and goodness of God to others around you in your community. Number one, pay for their food without them asking. What does it look like if you're just like, no, nah, I got the bill this week. I'm not going to stress you like that. Pay for their food without them asking. Number two, Take out the trash before there is a conversation. Number three, spend time listening to your friends without talking about yourself for five minutes. That's a tough ask, even for me. Number four, clean up after yourself and clean up someone else's mess, dinner tables, siblings, whatever it looks like. Number five, extend forgiveness for wrongs, large and small. Number six, Spend more time serving in some capacity and less time playing video games, or you fill them. Number seven, more time in a face-to-face -face conversation than in your screen. I can't tell you how many times I have thought somebody was mad at me because we had a tough conversation or an important conversation through a text instead of just picking up the phone or even just sitting across from them at a table with a coffee. Number eight, Pray for your friends, like out loud over them the next time they ask you for your prayers. If you text me, and I'm not perfect at this, I missed it the other day, but if you text me and say, hey, will you pray for me? I have started doing this thing where I try to make sure in that I can stop whatever I'm doing, and using the voice memo on my phone, I will say a prayer and then send it. Because you know what it's doing? It's helping me practice prayer, and then you actually heard that you were prayed for, not just told, I'm praying for you. Y'all, what would it look like in your community, in your school, in your hallways, if when somebody walked up to you and said, hey, I need prayer, you stopped in the hallway and prayed over that person? That revival would break out in the halls of Peachtree Ridge or a whole middle school. It'd be wild. Number nine, own your faults and errors and ask for forgiveness. Number 10, tell people God loves them. He knows the great mission. It's the only mission. Jesus loved us with one thing. Go tell people that God loves them and wants a relationship with them. So, bands up here, we're gonna, I'm gonna pray in a second and we're gonna respond in two ways. And, and the first is this. Y'all, if you're in here, God's been chasing you. Because he is. You can walk away from him, he's still chasing you. You've never placed your faith in Jesus. And you're like, you know what? Today, I'm tired of the running. I'm tired of trying to fill up my own gaps, trying, tired of trying to cope with everything to find peace. Like today, I surrender. 
And then through that, that surrender, through that submission to Jesus as your Lord, he will then walk you into a beautiful life where he promises you will have life to the full. Are there going to be hard moments? Yes, he told us that. But it's worth it. If not just for eternal life, for the fact that you are walking with me, with, with God of the universe. And he's going to send a spirit inside of you and it's going to be beautiful. If that's you tonight, you're, you're tired of running and God is chasing you. While I'm praying, you find an adult in this room who's available. And Cece is available. She's only doing slides. It's easy. I got that. And you take that, you take that leader, you say, listen, I'm tired of running, I'm tired of the pain, I'm tired of the hurt, and I want Jesus in my life. And you go, you go to your small group room, and you talk about it. And I'll tell you what, the rest of your friends in small group will sit their happy butts on the ground outside while you find Jesus. Or while you ask questions. Or while we pray over you. Because that is worth celebrating and is far more important than small group. And we do believe in small groups. So if that's you tonight, and you're ready to step out of death and your sin into life in Christ, that's my invitation to you. The second one is this. There's some of you in here they need to reconcile. There's some of you in here who over the last couple of weeks, there's been drama, there's been gossip, there's been fighting, there's been talking through text instead of talking face to face. And you've got beef. And you would say, yeah, we're both children of God, but we're fighting right now. Can I tell you that when you fight with your brother or sister, as it says in Matthew, that there creates a wedge between you and your heavenly father? And so maybe the reason why God feels distant right now is because you created distance between you and your friend. And here's my challenge to you. You grab that friend by the arm. You look them in the eyeballs and say, we're doing this. And I don't care what beef y'all got. And you get down front here. And then through prayer, you step into the throne room in the family room of God's your father, and you work that crap out. You pray it out, man. You reconcile before your heavenly father and the king of the universe. And you can pray. So you can get back to being on mission. Instead of like pettiness and temporariness, tear it all up. Those are my two invitations. That's what I got. I'm going to pray for us. They're going to lead us in awesome worship. And I'm going to do a small group. Dear God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your kindness and goodness as displayed through Jesus on the cross. That Jesus would die in our place and pay our payment and then offer us a free gift of restoration and relationship. And thank you that you are a God who's not full of, hey, get this right before you come to me, that you came to us first, that you called us out, that you chose us. And that you just want a relationship with us. I pray that there would be metanoia in the room tonight. I pray that when these students think about you, they are thinking about how you think about them. That they are valued, they are chosen, they are loved, they are called, they are blessed, and ultimately they are desired by you. I pray for the students who are going to reconcile this room tonight, Lord, that you give them discernment, and even if it's just tears and ugly crying, that at least then their hearts are relieved. And just like you promised when we come to you, that your, your yoke is easy and the burden is light, that they would feel that as they surrender their beef and their stuff with you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this week's message from Fountain Students. Man, listen, if this talk touched you, will you just leave us a comment down below this video? I also would encourage you and, and, and ask you to share this with your friends that they might get to hear some of the good news of Jesus and what he can do in their lives. Listen, we meet every Wednesday at 6.30, and we meet on Sundays as well at 9 a.m. And if you're a 6th or 12th grade student, you are invited. We're a community for all people, regardless of where you're at in your faith. So we'd invite you personally, I invite you and your friends to come hang out with us each and every week. Make sure you're following us on Instagram, at The Fountain Students, so that way you're best connected and in the know of what we're doing each and every week. I love you like crazy. Be free.